Welcome back everyone. Um, so I figured I'd just do a quick video and we'll talk about what machines I currently have in the collection and what's the status of everything so far. Um, I don't have a lot of battery life left, so I'm going to try to make this quick. So starting from over here, the Tandy 425SX, um, I just acquired this. Um, I've done a little bit of work to it, new clock battery, um, swapped out the hard drive. Um, the, um, I gave it a good thorough cleaning. That's all documented uh, in the video that I made of this machine. As of right now, it's up and running. Um, I had been troubleshooting. Oh, it had a weird problem that I later determined was a viral attack. Yeah, it had a virus. And I didn't find the virus until I was doing some stuff with the Tandy 1000 HX. I needed to use this machine to format some floppy disks in 720k uh, format. And as I was popping those formatted disks into my um, my new my newer Windows 10 based Think Center, um, it was starting to mark them as having viruses. I'm like, what on earth? I, at first, I thought it was a false alarm. I'm thinking, well, maybe it doesn't. There's some something about this the the uh, 720k uh, diskette format that I just doesn't like and. And then I noticed that I was putting in 1.44 meg diskettes that I know had been in this machine with the right protect off. And sure enough, I started scanning a couple more disks and before you know it, I've had a big problem on my hands. The virus was not dissimilar from the NYB virus, which was released in 19, in the early 90s. Actually, no, the NYB virus, I think it goes back to the early, early 90s. But this had a virus that was a, um, it would infect the master boot record and destroy executable files. Um, and it would spread just by putting the disk in or accessing the disk. It would immediately write the virus to the boot record. Um, so it was infected, the hard drive was infected, and any unwrite protected disk that I read or wrote to was infected. And I think I know where the virus came from. It came from the computer, or actually came from some of the software that came with the computer. And it doesn't surprise me because the gentleman who owned it before me was a network security expert. And so it's kind of not surprising, but it, it did cause some damage to a lot of my software. Thankfully, I have multiple backup copies of everything I have. So I was able to restore all the floppies I did an FDisk slash MBR to wipe the virus from the hard drive and all as well. But that was causing some programs not to run. Um, one of the things that that virus does is it eats up, I believe it's extended memory or no, uh, base memory. It just eats it all up. Like, yeah. So a lot of older DOS stuff wouldn't run. And now we know why. I've got some uh, cartridges on order for this printer. I've got two colors and two blacks. So um, if you guys need cartridges, um, there's two places I can recommend. One of them, I have a business card that I had just tossed somewhere. I think it's ribbonsunlimited.com. So Ribbons Unlimited actually has the cartridges for this printer. If you're looking for a color ribbon for a candy uh, DMP... 250. Um, it is the same color ribbon. You won't find it for the DMP 250. They don't exist. So you have to find one for a Citizen GSX 145. So the 145 uses the same ribbon, and that is how I was able to find it. Um, so I have two being shipped to me from, I believe, New York. So that'll be nice. Ah, the LC3. Uh, you know, this machine has been sitting here for quite some time. I haven't done anything with it. Um, I just love the way it looks. The LC3 is one of my favorite computers, um, favorite desktop computers of all time. And you see people have these in their collection, and they are, um, they've got LCD monitors, you know, um, sitting on top of them. For me, it's the monitor is at least four-fifths of the design of the machine. If you don't have the CRT monitor, not this particular monitor, 
and you have like the swivel base one or you've got an aftermarket one or you've got an LCD, it just doesn't work for me. Uh, it, it's, again, I only have the machine because I have that monitor. If I didn't have the monitor, I wouldn't have the whole, so I would have, I would have got acquired something else. But um, that's just my opinion. I think it's a beautiful system just that way. Wouldn't have it any other way. Now the 2GS, I've had some troubles with this machine as of late, and um, I'm going to need some advice from anyone who does CRT monitor repair. If, specifically, if you understand and know how these work, um, what happens to this machine, and I've actually figured out a way to, to compensate for it so it doesn't do it again, but it's not a solution. Now let me explain. Um, I don't have any footage of this actually happening, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to falsify the symptom, so to speak. So let's say I turn it on. This is what it looks like. Whining and everything. This is bad for it. I'll leave it like that. Turn it on and I get this whine and it's out of sync. The horizontal sync is way off. So I'll go back and I'll go to the horizontal sync control and I'll center the image best I can. Okay? Then I'll turn the computer off. The monitor can be left on, turned off, doesn't matter. Turn it off. Turn it back on again. Comes up again. Out of sync. Okay, so then I'll go right up back here and I'll manipulate the horizontal sync. I'll get it going. All's well. Wash, rinse, and repeat. Otherwise, the monitor displays a crisp, bright, clean image. You don't see a lot of um, uh, convergence issues with the, uh, with the electron guns. Everything looks pretty good. It's sharp. It's bright. There's no burn-in. But that problem is a bit vexing. So, a couple of things came to my mind. Um, well, aging passive components, resistors, capacitors... I also thought about well, maybe the, um, the the pot for the horizontal uh, horizontal sink is off, or uh, I'm sorry, is dirty. So I would rotate the knob back and forth a few times. Didn't make a difference. And usually, if a potentiometer is is um, is either dirty or uh, oxidized internally, just by tapping on the uh, you know, tapping on it or just moving it a little bit will, will cause all kinds of problems. It doesn't do that. And that doesn't explain why when I shut it off and turn it back on again, it's out of sync. So, here's how I, I, figured, I figured it out. So, I realized that it works better when the display is off-center. When it's off-center, it seems to be okay. It's only when I center it that it um, it malfunctions. So what I did is I got it off I got it to a working state. I powered it off, powered it back on again, and it stayed working, but the image was off center. So then I went back, and there's a hidden potentiometer. You have to a, uh, so once you remove the back cover, you can access the service pots. There's a couple of other options and such. And I went ahead and I um, started. Recentering it, there's a hidden horizontal center uh, pot that you can rotate. So I recentered it, and since then, it hasn't malfunctioned once. But there are some passive components at play that keep it in sync, and I'm wondering if those are starting to uh, drift out of value, or the value is drifting out of spec. It should be recapped, and I will be doing that eventually. Um, but I just thought I'd, if anyone has an idea as to what that might be, I don't think it's one of the known issues with this display. There are many issues, actually at least one issue that plagues this model, but I don't think that's the problem. So if anyone has any ideas, hit me up. I'd love to hear what you have to say. But yeah, recapping it, I'm going to make a, a shopping list on Mauser with all the caps that it uses. And I'll just take an afternoon or an evening and I'll just replace them all. Um, 
I need to keep it alive. <laughs> it's a piece of history. The Commodore SX-64. What can I tell you about the SX-64? Well, we got it running. That's for sure. Um, it was just a bad um, uh, PLA chip. <laughs> Thank you. Not a Commodore guy. Remember that. No, it was a bad PLA chip, and that's all it was. So, what happens to it next? Well, we still need a keyboard membrane. I have the original one, but it is damaged. Um, possibly irreversibly. And I am actually just waiting for this the, an, another uh, round of reproduced uh, membrane um, pads for this thing. So, the gentleman who um, sells these... Uh, repl not the, let me rephrase that. He sells the uh, reproduction membranes. I've contacted him, and he said that possibly by mid-February they might have another run of them. Um, but he currently is sold out due to the pandemic. Production's been down. So I'm going to recheck with him again. And uh, for about 30 bucks plus shipping from the United Kingdom, I'll have another uh, membrane for it, a brand new one and we'll have the keyboard up and running again. So, yay. Uh, now, you all, well, most of you know that the SX-64 is worth a good chunk of change, uh, probably about as much as a fully decked out 2GS. It is actually one of the most valuable computers sitting in this room right now. I'm serious, out of all the machines you see here, except Oreo, the SX-64 is worth more than every single one of them based on current eBay selling trends. Now, we know how accurate those are, but it is a gauge. It is a barometer of what people are paying for them, and it's crazy. I'm seeing prices between 700 I think I saw one go for a thousand bucks in in that condition. So, just the keyboard alone is worth about a hundred bucks in working condition, or maybe 60 bucks or so in working condition. So what am I going to do with it? Well, I have no interest in diversifying into Com Commodores. I just don't. It was offered to me. I said, you know what? I'll take it. I've decided I'm not going to sell it. I'm not selling it. I'm going to offer it back to the gentleman who gave it to me in the first place. I think he is going to regret giving it to me. I'm going to make the repairs, I'm going to make the videos, and I'm going to, you know, get some ad revenue from that, and I'm going to give him the machine back, because that's the right thing to do. If he doesn't want it back, then I'll hang on to it, but I feel that he should have it back. Um, he's owned it since the 1980s. He's not the original owner, but he bought it used. He's owned it for more than 30 years, and I think he should keep it. So, if he, Or he can sell it. And he can sell it. I don't want any money for it. That's what's happening to the Commodore. Um, again, I have no interest <laughs> in in branching into Commodores because that's just a rabbit hole. I look. I've got Apple's. I got Macs. I got Windows. I got freaking Tandy. I don't need more problems. I've got enough, right, Oreo? He agrees. So, moving along. Upstairs, we've got the Tandy One Thousand. HX. That was my childhood computer. We still have that. Um, it is now sporting a printer, which as you saw in the previous video, if you watched it, um, it is uh, it is in good running condition. Um, I actually have all the parts ordered for the um, the three in one plus interface card thing. Um, so for those of you who are in the know, um, yes, I ordered I ordered the kit. Um, I actually had to build my own kit. So all he sells right now are the boards, um, just the bare boards, and the custom header connectors and the custom backplane cover. So those are, I got all those. Um, so I had to build a shopping list on Mauser. It cost me about 45 bucks to get all the rest of the stuff, plus a few parts on eBay. So that... So that is uh, that is upstairs. I'm just waiting for that shipment to arrive. Oreo's going for a little ride in there. So let's uh, fire up the Mac Classic. You know, we didn't turn on the uh, the LC3. Let's do that.
Every once in a while I like to fire these up. Just make sure they still run. That's when I find out that they don't run and I have more stuff to fix and more parts to order. It's kind of fun like that. So I got the uh, classic. Now this one here, I did a complete recap um, job a couple years ago, about, about a year or two ago. And so far it's holding up nicely. Um, it's a very nice little, uh, nice little machine. Now, why did I pick a classic over a classic two? Well, because when I was in middle school, we had a computer lab filled with Macintosh classics, not classic twos. We had Mac classics and we had LC twos. Um, and you know what? We were okay with that. Well, no, we weren't, but that's what we had access to. We don't really count the Think Center as a collector's item. It's just a workstation, and that's all it is. Um, it comes in handy a lot. I do. I don't do any video editing. I do all my video editing on my on my uh, ThinkPad laptop upstairs. But uh, the Think Center is always there as a reliable little workhorse, and uh, it just does what it does. So the G5, G5, the yeah, the G, the G5 iMac. I don't know what's going to happen to it. Um, I don't think I've powered it on once since I picked it up. It just sits here collecting dust. Let's see if it runs. I, I know it does. I got this guy from its original owner. And uh, it's had a logic board replacement, a hard drive replacement, and a RAM expansion. All done by, I think I did most of that many years ago. I did some of that too. So we got the, uh, the LC3 going. We got the iMac G5 going. So we got one more here. We got the iMac G3. It's another one I bought from its original owner. But of these two machines, I'm more than likely going to get rid of this one. This one's going to stay. These are worth something. These are worth nothing. Uh, the uh, the early iMacs just or the iMac G5s and the Intel iMacs have no value right now, as far as I know. They're not really collectible enough. They're not rare. They're not collectible. They're just old computers right now. Someday they'll be worth something. Well, that day isn't now. So, in the order, in the interest of saving space, I might put this guy up for sale at some point. But this one here. No, I can't get rid of that. It's uh, it's, it's too nice. <laughs> this is um, this G3 iMac. This is the first release of iMacs. This was the um, not the initial production run, but it was part of it was um, before the revision B. It's a revision A. That's really all you need to know, I guess. Uh, but it was actually manufactured in 1998, so it is um, it is the OG iMac, and uh, I've deliberately kept it um, original. I did not upgrade the hard drive. I didn't add any RAM or anything. I think it actually has had RAM added to it, but I'm not sure how much. It's got 160 megabytes of RAM. Oh, that's built in, yeah. So, yeah, it's got, yeah, it's actually had some RAM added to it, um, but otherwise original six gig hard drive and it's still alive and kicking. Let's talk about some stuff I don't have anymore. So I just recently sold five laptops. I sold, um, I actually gave away one. The one that was sent to me by a fellow YouTuber, that's been, yeah, that's gone. I uh, gave it away for the price of shipping. And uh, the, the, young, the young gentleman who owns it now is actually happily working on it, trying to get it fixed up. And uh, I wish him all the best. <laughs> Of course, anything's fixable with enough determination. Um, I just have no use for it because I have a Mint G4 iBook sitting in one of those cases. I got rid of the Intel, the, the first, was it, the, the black MacBook, um, 2008 MacBook. It was a uh, 2.4 gigahertz model. And um, it was it was one of the models that was painted or, or finished in a nice matte black finish. And uh, I uh, I sold that. I sold the 17-inch MacBook Pro that I had from 2008. 
I sold the, um, I had an, an iBook G4 and an iBook G3, 12 inch G3, a 14 inch G4. All four of those machines went to the same guy. He wanted all of them. And I said, okay. So I cut him a deal, he paid for shipping, all's well. I got a bunch of laptops left and I have an Apple to see upstairs in the master bedroom. Um, yeah, so I got the Apple 2C and I got that 2GS. So we got this compact here. I, I just have been playing with this one. Um, this this one reminds, this is uh, very almost identical to the one I got from one of my best friends in high school. And uh, this, this compact is, um, it's one of those laptops I'll probably never get rid of because it has some sentimental value to me. Not much, but some. Um, but it's also one of the nicest LTEs I've ever seen. And it wasn't by accident. I actually rebuilt this one from parts from one or two other units. I also added this CD drive, which this is a very rare option for this model, so um, they're almost impossible to find. And uh, real quick, if you've got one of these and you have the infamous... Um, so what happens to these is these little doors. The latches have these tiny little plastic springs built into them. You can see the remnants of this one here. Well, those springs are made of ABS plastic and they always break, even when they were new. When these were brand new, when these were two, three years old, those springs would break. And I found that a little bit of clear silicone, I actually used windshield flowable silicone for windshields and you you have to rig the latch in its outboard position and put a little bit of silicone in there let that dry and it acts as a rubber spring fixing the problem forever I did that for both doors the CF or the uh, expansion card or the PCM CIA card door and the hard drive door once you resolve that problem and you have the doors intact assuming you do um, these are great little machines. Um, they have amazing sound for a laptop of that time period. Um, the other problem with these, and this is something you almost can't fix. It, it's almost impossible. And this was a problem that started when these were like about a year or two old. These, L these LCD panels right here, which display system status L L uh, icons, um, they almost always fail and you start to lose segments I can't, I can't get a good angle on that yeah put the, the light on oh my battery is about to die damn it anyway these go bad and there's no fix for it there just isn't so that all having been said I still have a couple of laptops over there I'm gonna try to rattle them off I've got the compact portable restored ready to go ThinkPad 355c a Veritech uh, Pentium 4. I've got an IBM 760XL, a Mac PowerBook um, 170. I've got a PowerBook 165. I've got the, uh, of course, the LTE. And I have a PowerBook G4, we would say 14 inch in that, in those bags over there. Um, I mentioned I have a 2C, Apple 2C. I've also got at work an NEC Versa, the, the one that I fixed up a couple years ago. That's still there. Um, and I think I've got a non-working deck high note kicking around somewhere. I think that might be at work too. Oh yeah, we still have the 99 cent Windows 98 machine. That's still that's still a thing. It's still there. Monitors. I got a flat panel monitor for it and I got that guy. So No room to set it up right now. I'm going to reorganize this room at some point and I'll make more stations. But um, I'll have to get rid of this desk and then put countertops all around the perimeter. That's the plan. Not going to happen today. i got other projects to do, but that's the plan in the future. So thank you for watching. And uh, this is my current state of the collection <laughs> as of February 2021.